if you please call the roll. Somebody take Peter and roll. Mentioned. 
Dedicated, kind, passionate, a strong voice but gentle spirit, firm convictions, spiritual, resilient, a team player, and I think the, the best one to describe the glory is a light for others. So Lori, I just want to just commend you for your many years of service to Calvary Parish for your continued commitment because Lori is going to continue to serve on this board. Your continued commitment to the coastal program and congratulations on a well-deserved retirement. So. And with that, we're going to move right into agenda item number six, the CPR implementation update by Mr. Haas. Good morning. Thank morning. you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, as always, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, I did want to touch on something before I, I get into the, uh, the implementation update, and it's related to uh, what Chairman Klein alluded to earlier and some of the opportunities that have been afforded to us related to the oil spill. So you all will recall back in December, you authorized us to uh, seek an amendment to our state implementation plan for bucket three uh, restore dollars. That would reallocate $60 million to the waterfall swamp project. Um, with your approval, of course, we did that, uh, submitted it to the restore council in order to announce that that amendment was approved last month. And so I'm uh, very thankful for your leadership and forethought in allowing us to do that, and certainly thankful to the Restore Council uh, as well for allowing us to do that. And this, as we've discussed in the past, um, will go toward the uh, $130 million that was already awarded from Bucket 2 for this project, uh, and will allow us full funding to, uh, to begin and complete uh, construction of this project. I uh, don't want to put the cart before the horse, but we do anticipate an announcement that ground will be broken on that project. This year. So, and the opportunity, of course, that it provides, as we've discussed in the past, is to integrate uh, a risk reduction project with the West Shore uh, Lake Monster Train Hurricane Risk Reduction Project with the Restoration Project, which is what this agency was developed to, uh, to accomplish uh, in the first place. So, really big deal. Really appreciate, again, the leadership of this group and the Restore Council for allowing us the opportunity to pursue that. So, it's good news there. So we'll move on into the implementation update. There we go. So once again this month, I'll report that we've got 101 active projects. Uh, 35 of those are in construction, 58 in engineering and design, and eight in planning. Uh, of those projects in construction, 14 are hurricane risk reduction projects, 10 are marsh creation projects. Those marsh creation projects lead the way to projects that we're designing right now. Uh, at 33. So we'll talk about a few specific projects as I do typically. We're going to start on the uh, easternmost easternmost uh, portion of the state, the Biloxi Marsh Living Shoreline Project. This project will create living oyster reefs along a shoreline in Bay Elwha in St. Bernard Parish, right about uh, near the mouth of Bayou Lutra uh, in that region to help protect uh, the marshes that have eroded uh, in that region. Uh, and indeed, uh, that have been a problem all over St. Bernard Parish. About 16,000 acres, in fact, of coastal wetlands have uh, been lost just in St. Bernard Parish since the 1930s or so. So what you see here uh, is one of two products that will be used uh, for this Living Shorelines project. These are shore jacks. Uh, you see them being staged in the yard near the project site here. The idea behind this project is to provide essentially hardened structures, uh, another uh, product that will be used is called a wave attenuator device, or a watch, you may have heard them call. Uh, but they'll be placed along the Bay Elwha shoreline. Uh, not only will these structures themselves provide shoreline protection benefits to those shorelines, but they provide a hard substrate for oysters to hopefully colonize, with the idea being uh, ultimately uh, the oyster reef itself will be a vertical feature in front of those shorelines and actually serve the shoreline protection feature uh, or function uh, for this project. Once this project is complete, about 11 miles of shoreline will be protected uh, in this area. So as I, as I do each month, and uh, certainly we'll, we'll continue that today, about 109 jobs will be created uh, as a result of this project, or 109 folks will be, will be at work here. 
Uh, you can see the firms here. There are four, excuse me, five firms that are working on this project. Again, all with Louisiana ties or, or headquarters. In fact, Premier Concrete is headquartered right here in the Capital Region in Denham Springs. Rigid Construction, for example, is headquartered uh, in Lafayette. This is a $57 million project. It's being funded again uh, through oil spill dollars for the Natural Resources Damage Assessment uh, dollars by the Louisiana TIG. So excited to have this project underway. We'll move a little bit to the north and. and have a clicker trouble, forgive me. Well, you saw the star there. We're moving a little bit to the north, <laughs> to the north and the uh, and the uh, and the west of that previous project. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, and talk about the New Orleans Land Bridge shoreline uh, stabilization and restoration project. So this project's on the New Orleans Land Bridge. It's on the eastern uh, shoreline of Lake Pontchartrain. It'll create about 284 acres of brackish marsh in this region, uh, basically along the Highway 90 corridor and the land bridge between uh, Lakes Pontchartrain and Lake Bourne in the vicinity of Lake St. Catherine. So you see some of the degraded marsh here that will be restored. Uh, this is, uh, it's, it's worth noting, this is one of the, the narrowest regions of the uh, East Orleans land bridge that separates Lakes Pontchartrain and Lake Bourne. It protects much of uh, the, the northern extent of the town of the city of New Orleans and the North Shore as well. Inger, could I get you to maybe man the, are you, is that what happened to the clicker? You're, uh, okay. I'll say next slide next time I'm ready, okay. So uh, again, uh, this project is uh, employing uh, three firms. All of these have Louisiana ties. In fact, are headquartered in Louisiana. The Magnolia Dredge and Dock Company is headquartered in Mandeville, Wilco in Harvey, Louisiana, and uh, Linfield Hunter Juniors in Metairie, Louisiana. This is a $24 million project. This is being funded through the Quipper Program. Our federal uh, partner is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on this project. Next slide, please. What is, what is the timing of that construction? Uh, it's going right now. So they're building the hard structures right now and prepping the, the area for placement of those. I just want to reiterate that the video footage that you saw <laughs> is just green. So <laughs> that's I want you to think of that as completed construction. I just want to point that out. That's the good point. Yes, yeah, so thanks. That is the good point. So moving on a little bit to the, uh, to the south and to the west, we'll talk about the Bayou de Cat Marsh and Ridge Restoration Project. This is in Terrebonne Parish, uh, an area that's lost about 20% of its coastal wetlands over the last uh, 80 years or so. This project will create about 500 acres of coastal wetlands uh, in Terrebonne Parish, about 12,000 feet of ridge and habitat along Bayou de Cat. Next slide, please. So this is a... Uh, look at the project area. This project obviously is under construction. You can see the end of the dredge pipe there with the equipment manipulating that sediment. Um, you can see uh, part of the bayou in the background there. This is a little different from what we normally show you. It's maybe not quite as dramatic with the sediment leaving the end of the dredge pipe, but this is a, a lot different situation than what we'll typically show you. So this isn't a, a barrier island or, or a very, very large uh, marsh creation area that, um, that can handle sort of high volumes of water and sediment. Um, in this case, low and slow, if you will, uh, sort of wins the race, and so that's what you see is a little bit of a smaller dredge, uh, but we're making steady progress and good progress in this region, and happy to see uh, this project moving on toward completion. And Next slide, like, please. Uh, right. Source yes. Is it Lake the Cat? Source of yeah, the source of material for this is, is Lake the Cat. That's right. So again, a number of people are at work at this, at this uh, project. About 85 jobs uh, are, uh, are being uh, kept busy uh, with this project. A uh, number of firms that give Louisiana ties, Lonnie Harper, for example, the Lake Charles firm, GEC is located right here in Baton Rouge, T. Baker Smith is founded and is still headquartered in Homa, for example. It's another uh, project of about $25 million. Uh, it's funded through the Quipper program and our federal partner on this project is Miller. Next slide, please. So moving further to the, to the west and south uh, in Cameron and I think that other project is either on the border or perhaps includes both Cameron and Vermillion Parish. But I'm uh, happy to report that we've been successful in being awarded uh, FEMA claims for two projects here associated with damages caused by Hurricane Laura. 
So repairs to the Cameron Creole watershed, water control structures along the lake. You see those yellow dots there along the, the eastern shore of Calcasieu Lake. We've been awarded about $2.8 million to repair those, again, related to uh, hurricane damages from Hurricane Laura. The other projects a little to the, uh, to the east of there, the freshwater introduction south of Highway 22. Uh, repairs were awarded $2.4 million to repair both the intakes and, and uh, outflow, outfall uh, sections of four water control structures there. So, very pleased with that. As you all know, it can be challenging working with FEMA, uh, and uh, having our claims accepted is, uh, is quite a victory. So, we're excited about that and to be able to get those projects in good repair and operating as intended. Uh, we also hope here work very soon on the Rockefeller Shoreline Project. We've talked a lot about that in these meetings. Uh, and while the breakwaters themselves performed very well, there was no damage to them. There was some signage that was damaged. Uh, so there's a claim in uh, for that to get those repaired. And hopefully we'll hear about that relatively soon. Next slide, please. So again, keeping on that theme, I know we've talked a lot about Rockefeller Shoreline Protection Project, but uh, I want you all to, to be aware that, uh, and I think you're aware, I think I've mentioned it to you before, but the Louisiana chapter of the American Council of Engineering Companies uh, awarded uh, an Engineering Excellence Award to this project, Engineering Excellence Award for this project. Uh, I'm happy to report to you today that this project actually won an award at the national level. So the ACDC uh, National Group has provided or awarded a uh, what's called a grand award, one of their top awards for engineering excellence uh, in the United States of America. It's quite a prestigious award. That award will be given uh, next month at the Engineering Excellence Awards Gala. Understand it's the Academy Awards of the Engineering Community. We hope that they avoid any Chris Brock or Will Smith type of uh, situations and we'll trust that they will. But you might say, well, what's so special about this project? We're, we're dumping rocks on the shoreline, right? And uh, it really, I think, belies the fact that many of the projects that we complete that, that seem simple really are not. Um, if you think about the conditions that this project was constructed in, the soils are really, really poor. If you just go dump rock on those soils, they fall over, they sink out of sight, they don't last, and the project uh, would potentially not be effective. Uh, and we're in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the highest energy environment uh, really in the state if you think about ways attacking this. So the project team evaluated literally 50 plus uh, different alternatives for a way to accomplish this and sort of lighten these structures so they wouldn't sink, but they would still be strong enough to withstand uh, the energy in the Gulf of Mexico. As I mentioned, this withstood Hurricane Laura type waves. Um, they narrowed those 50 alternatives down to three, which were placed in the field uh, and monitored. Um, they were experimental structures, three different types of structures, so we could monitor their performance over time. That, of course, uh, one was selected, and a lightweight aggregate core type structure was, uh, was selected, and indeed one has been uh, put in place and performed quite well. Uh, I should mention this is another quick project that was built. Uh, at the NOAA was the uh, federal partner on this project, and special thanks really go to uh, Dr. John Foray, who is uh, a, a tremendous advocate and really a champion for this project for many, many years. Um, also want to thank uh, and congratulate HDR, which was the uh, project engineer, LeBlanc, LeBlanc Marine, excuse me, of New Iberia, um, and the uh, field office, uh, our field office in Lafayette that oversaw construction of this project also deserve a, a note of thanks. So uh, really pleased to receive that award and uh, we'll be happy to accept that in uh, the end of May of this year. Next slide, please. And so rounding things out, many of you I think are aware not only obviously is today the anniversary of the oil spill, but we're also celebrating uh, Earth Week, Earth Day later this week. Uh, as part of that, we are participating in our uh, Love the Boot Group event. We'll be hosting this Saturday right here on the water campus uh, from 8 o'clock to uh, about 10 o'clock. We'll be here trying to beautify, obviously, the campus and the area and neighborhood around us as well to help keep Louisiana beautiful. These are uh, initiatives, of course, that are, that are supported very strongly by the governor and the lieutenant governor as well. So if you feel the urge, uh, weather ought to be beautiful, please join us at 8 o'clock Saturday morning. We'll be, uh, we'll be cleaning up. And that, I believe, next slide, concludes my presentation. Mr. Chairman, thank you all and the members for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brent. Can everybody hear? Okay, it sounds like this mic's getting like a lot better than Brent's mic. Mark, are you hearing okay? I heard you. We just, presenters just pay note that you might have to hold the mic a little closer to you. are out there. Uh, any questions or comments for Mr. Haas? I have one. 
Um, Brent, I was looking at your presentation and in, and in the uh, 101 active project, the, the categories where everything's at, I see it looks like the first nine is pretty much everything we do. What would be an example of other projects? you got five others in there? Just... Sure. So some of the other projects would include um, things like um, some of our, our friends work or adaptive management type work. Oh, okay. um, I'm just curious. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Let's call it. Brent, I don't know who's going to go to get the award, but it would be uh, remiss if y'all did not at least do one rocket, rocket, rocket. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm very grateful and thankful for that project, and, and hopefully at some point in my lifetime, the whole entire Cameron Shoreline will be rocked like that. But thank you for all the hard work that you guys and, and your partners did for that project. So, uh, I'm going to be really excited to see if they win. I can't imagine that they won't, but I'm grateful and thankful. So thank you all for all your hard work. Thank you, Lori. And I should have mentioned that, uh, I didn't mention the book project. First of all, we'll send a security wide and we'll put yeah. rocket, rocket, rocket on it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> secondly, I should have mentioned that the uh, book was just one of the funding sources. surge 
based on risk and build and maintain coastal wetlands and generally achieve the objectives of the coastal master plan as, as uh, identified and approved by, by this board. Uh, it is built on world-class science and engineering, and we will uh, touch on that today. And uh, one thing I really want to impress upon folks is this third bullet point is that it illustrates how the coast is going to change over time. In addition to using the models to, uh, to evaluate and prioritize projects, we can also project how different areas will experience coastal change, whether it's changes in landscapes or associated natural resources, or uh, perhaps most importantly, and what we're going to talk about today, changes in risk. Whether we're 100% uh, successful at implementing the projects we identify or not, we know that the coast 50 years from now is going to look very different from the coast uh, we have today. So, uh, Within our process, we really have three sets of models. The landscape model, or SEM, integrated compartment model, that's what we talked about last time. That's where we're projecting land change, uh, as well as uh, uh, associated uh, wetland morphology. Those landscapes, the, the changes in land water, the changes in vegetation, the changes in elevation, feed into our surge and wave modeling. So uh, when we're projecting future surge and wave modeling, we're, in, we're, we're uh, running uh, tropical storm, we're modeling tropical storms and hurricanes across those future landscapes with uh, those uh, more, more open water, deeper water bottoms, changes in vegetation, all things that affect uh, uh, the, the friction that attenuates storm surge. Uh, and then lastly, we, we take those uh, storm runs and come up with a, a statistical representation of the exceedance depths that those storms and surges that those storms will, will produce. Uh, and we take that uh, projected, those projected exceedance values and we compare those to, in a much more complex way than I'm going to uh, possibly convey, uh, the assets that are on the ground. So uh, flooding is not really, high water levels are not really an issue unless they interact with things that we care about. So we have an asset database uh, and we are trying to understand how those projected flood levels <coughs> And the likelihood of, of them uh, occurring uh, interact and cause damage to the assets uh, and communities that, that uh, we have in coastal Louisiana. Um, I was with you all back in uh, I think July of last year. We talked about some of the, the improvements to the modeling for the 2023 master plan. I will quickly touch on a, a few items uh, related to the, the surface risk modeling. Uh, there have been uh, significant improvements to the modeling um, uh, throughout the, the suite of models. In the risk model, one of the, the uh, things we want to focus on is the new storm suite. So this was developed by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have uh, a much better representation of storms across the coast. We also have better representation of high frequency storms, what we think of as like a five year or 10 year. Uh, storm and also uh, the significantly the, uh, much more infrequent storms, the 500,000 year storms. Uh, and so uh, the development of the storms would really give us a, a, a better understanding of, of potential flood depths and, and better representation of, of the, the range of potential storms that, that we could potentially see. On the risk side, I mentioned that, that we're interested in understanding how those projected flood depths impact uh, communities and assets, uh, one part of the improvements to the risk assessment was a, a significantly improved structure inventory. Um, so this is an area where there's actually been a lot of advancement over the last uh, five, six, seven years. It's actually largely driven by the insurance industry. Uh, but we were able to take a number of publicly available data sets as well as some of the proprietary data sets and use those to, uh, to basically QAQC the, the uh, existing data sets and come up with what we believe is a much more uh, 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 accurate uh, representation of structures in the coastal zone. Um, and then building on that, we're working with uh, Purdue University, who is using uh, a machine learning uh, approach and Google Street View to estimate first floor uh, elevation. And so this, of course, is really important when we're trying to understand what damage is caused by a two-foot flood, understanding what the, the first floor elevation of the structure is, is, is critically important. And previously, we, we had to make kind of, uh, uh, statistical assumptions about the distribution of those first floor elevations. 
Here we have a much more uh, regional and community specific estimates of, of that uh, parameter based on, on this analysis. Uh, another one I want to point out is that we have significantly improved um, resolution on the communities in which we're measuring risk. So in 2017, we had about 40, uh, 45 risk regions in say, and, and we could report out that risk in, say, Cameron Parish is X. Now we have around uh, like 205 communities, and we can report out with much higher uh, resolution that the, instead of the risk in Cameron is X, or Cameron Parish is X, we can say the risk in Hackberry is this, the risk in Johnson's Bayou is this, the risk in Creole is this. And so uh, that level of resolution is, I think, one improvement from our analysis and, and try to aggregate risk and how we may uh, approach mitigating that risk, but it's, it's a huge improvement in terms of how we can communicate this information um, going forward. So first one I'm going to show is initial conditions. Uh, so this is our flood projections given the, the current landscape and the current state of the, the uh, risk reduction effort uh, structures that are on the ground.
So uh, as we look forward, what is changing? I talked about the landscape is changing, the, the amount of land and water that is in the, the coastal area that is between these communities and, and the Gulf is, of course, changing. The vegetation types are changing. That affects the, the, the uh, there's associated friction with different vegetation types. Uh, and the elevation is changing, not just the elevation of the coastal wetlands uh, or, or ridges or barrier islands, but also the elevation of the water bottoms that is applied to uh, uh, water bottoms. Uh, additionally, sea level is rising. So we use two scenarios. We talked about these scenarios when we talked about the ICM outputs uh, at the last meeting. Uh, our lower scenario, sea level rise corresponds to what uh, to a curve that Noah refers to as the intermediate sea level rise scenario, uh, and the higher corresponds to the uh, Noah intermediate high scenario. So sea level is rising uh, in these models. Um, and additionally, uh, the literature suggests that with climate change, with warmer temperatures, we will see an increase in storm intensity. So we are applying a 5% uh, increase in storm intensity over the uh, 50 years in the lower scenario and 10% in the higher scenario. And so this is the same map I just showed you of initial conditions. The next five slides I'm going to show are the decadal time steps uh, of, of flood depths um, in our lower scenario. Uh, so I'm going I'm to click through them. You're going to notice uh, a similar trend if you're familiar with our 2017 modeling. The extent of flooding on the kind of northern boundary will, will uh, move northward. Uh, in most areas, and you'll see greater uh, flood depths in the areas that are in most of the flooding uh, currently. 20, 30, your 40, and your 50. Um, I didn't load the entire time step for our higher scenario, but to compare to 40 from the lower scenario, the next slide is year 50 from our higher scenario. So you'll see further uh, encroachment of flood depths uh, further up in the basins and then higher flood depths uh, in the areas that are our current controls. So those are the flood depth projections. Now we're going to move into risk models. Um, so when we're talking about risk, we have uh, two metrics or two sets of metrics that we use to talk about risk. Uh, the first is EAD uh, dollars, we've added a dollar sign this year to differentiate it from that second metric. Uh, but this is a, a, a common approach uh, to measuring risk. It is an annualized uh, uh, measurement of damage in dollars. Uh, we know that damage from storms doesn't happen on an Basis. It happens in these large episodic events, but not knowing when and where those events are going to happen. Uh, this is an approach that by understanding those exceedance probabilities and by understanding the damage that will be caused by those flood depths associated with those exceedance probabilities, we can estimate a annualized uh, damage in dollars. The second metric uh, is uh, expected annual structure. This is a new metric that we developed uh, for this master plan. Uh, the, the, um, it's slightly more complicated than the text uh, would indicate, but the key is that we're removing asset values from the uh, calculation. Um, and so the uh, EASB is uh, something that we're exploring. Uh, criticisms of approaches like a, a benefit cost assessment and uh, EAD approach are that they implicitly, uh, they may implicitly uh, prioritize areas with uh, more valuable assets or uh, wealthier neighborhoods. And so this is an approach that is trying to get it uh, being agnostic to that, that value. And we have some testing plans to see how we can uh, use both of these to identify and prioritize projects going forward. This is something, the, the ASD metric is something that is going to require a fair amount more explanation, and uh, I expect that I will be back with you all at a, a future meeting uh, and get into more detail about that. Um, for the rest of this presentation, we're going to focus on EAD dollars, not because it is 
necessarily more useful, but because we have the comparison to 2017, we can show, and the units that they do are warranted, uh, hopefully as well, to the development process. So when we're talking about EAD, uh, I want to point out that we're, we're talking not just about structure damage, and so that's sometimes uh, misleading. Uh, structure damage represents about 32% of that uh, calculation. Uh, in EAD, it also includes damage to contents and inventory of those structures, it damage to roads, vehicles, crops. It includes lost wages, sales, rents during the repair and reconstruction. Uh, it also includes displacement costs uh, and temporary relocation, and it includes cleanup costs for, for debris and, and to repair <coughs> landscaping. Um, this is probably pretty intuitive to those of you who have been through floods and experienced this. Uh, the, the costs of, of recovery are much greater than, than just the damage to uh, the, the buildings and uh, structures. Um, within our estimate, uh, on the, the table on the right, we see that about 65% of our total EAD is attributable to single family residences. Uh, so that number changes over time as different uh, areas are exposed to more or less risk. Um, the uh, the uh, second largest category is commercial and industrial, where it's about 26%. So over 90% of, uh, of EAD is, is accounted for in those two categories. And this is of risk, not of the entire, uh, not of the entire inventory. These are our, our structures that are at risk. And so this is what risk looks like under our initial condition uh, geographically. And so we obviously have, have risk in all parts of the coast, but uh, because we're looking at a combination of flood exposure and the uh, assets that, that are at risk, you see it, it concentrated in, in some of the uh, more populated areas, uh, particularly those that, that do not have a district system around them. So the, uh, uh, we'll go to the, the next slide. Um, about 50% of the total risk in the coast is in these 10 communities. And about 15% of the total risk that we are uh, uh, seeing is in Slidell, the amount of prohibited communities. Um, one thing I, I failed to highlight on the slides, those two slides ago, our projections for 2023, similar to our, our flooding projections, which are greater, our projections of risk for initial conditions are about double what they were in our initial condition projections in 2017. So uh, I'll go ahead and go back so we can see the numbers. But our total risk is about 5.5 billion uh, EAD in uh, the 2023 projections. It was about 2.7 in the current conditions projections in uh, 2017. Uh, again, that is, there are about there are many different variables at work, but uh, largely that is about the, the uh, new storm suite, the improved storm suite, improved coverage of the, the uh, projected uh, uh, storm suite. So uh, as we look at risk over time, what is changing? All the things we talked about earlier that affect flood depths are changing, as we saw maps earlier of, of uh, flood depth exceedances, uh, but additionally, population and assets are changing. So uh, the assets are proportional to the population, uh, and we are projecting population change based on a demographic model uh, that was developed by uh, a gentleman named Matt Howard, who's at Florida State University. I would be doing Matt and his model a tremendous disservice if I tried to explain it to you all, but uh, we do have a, a presentation Matt was, was willing to record for us on our website if, if folks want to uh, understand the, the details of that model, but it's uh, generally it's based on historic trends and the current demographic makeup of the uh, community uh, uh, currently. So 
there are assumptions that you can make about communities that largely have young people. Those people tend to have children, uh, and, and uh, older people tend to not be in those communities for uh, when you're projecting out 50 years. And so that's kind of how the, the uh, demographic model works. Um, so this is the uh, comparison over time to the 2020 or 2017 uh, expected annual damages uh, projections. The uh, dashed lines are the low, medium, and high scenarios for 2017. The solid lines are the lower and higher scenarios from 2023. So again, we start with uh, projecting more risk and the curves trend in the, the same direction as, as uh, we projected in 2017, but, but again, and higher than, than we projected. And so this is the difference in EAD from year 50 to initial conditions. Uh, uh, this is in our lower scenario, uh, again, we are projecting, this is not just flood exposure, we're projecting those population changes too. So some areas may see more flood exposure, but the population is relatively stable or perhaps even declining, and so you don't see a significant increase in risk. Areas like uh, Homo, for example, we see both increased exposure to flooding and population change in, in Homo, or population increase in Homo and Bayou Blue and Bayou Cane. Um, and so that, that uh, really amplifies the, the risk that, that we're projecting. And similarly, this uh, Lillian and Boutique area, Slidale, uh, Covington, Mandeville uh, area as well. And this is under the higher scenario, uh, similar uh, pattern. We also see additional risk moving into uh, some of the Baton Rouge suburbs, the Sorrento and Gonzales. Uh, area. Additional risk in, in new area. So uh, this is uh, yeah. So the 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 good news about this this is obviously a, a significant risk that we're projecting in the coast. The good news is that we have projects the. The Army Corps has projects, the Parachutes have projects. They're in various stages of feasibility and engineering and design that can help alleviate this risk, that can help mitigate this risk that will be very effective. So the Morganza system, the Upper Barrett Area Risk Reduction System, the, the St. Tammany and uh, Slidell Area Risk Reduction Systems are going to be uh, um, very effective at mitigating some of this future risk. Uh, so, so Stu, that was Karen and I were just, just talking about. She was looking at St. Tammany on the map. And I reminded her that that's the future without action. And she reminded me, yes, that that's in 50 years. So hopefully, I mean, you, you just kind of answered my question. I'm glad you hit on that. But there are projects right now that are very close to the you got to choose from the next step to authorize that project. Uh, hopefully, the word of bill this year. St. Tammany, under Mr. John Krieger's here, is working through the feasibility study on reaching a tentatively selected plan on that. So there are projects in the works that will reduce risk in these particular areas. In South Central Louisiana, the Corps continues to push that. And we've got $214 million, excuse me, not, we've got 125 or $240 million for Southwest Coastal, mostly aimed towards home elevations. We are pushing the Corps to look at Marsh creation aspect of those projects or that authorization there. So, so do we have any, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, do, do we have any hypothetical maps of the future if those particular projects are kind of slated for authorization well, on what that looks like? We will. That's the ongoing uh, model. So this is our future without action. What is going on right now is we're modeling uh, individual projects. There's 26 different structural risk reduction projects that we are evaluating. It includes a uh, version of the St. Tammany project, the Ontario Risk Reduction. It includes the uh, Abbeville and vicinity area and the, the New Iberia area. And so we'll be able to, to uh, quantify that risk reduction provided by those, those projects um, later in the summer. So if 
Was that something we see next month? Give us a few months. Oh, I got all these stars written everywhere. Some of this presentation. So, uh, to, to reiterate, uh, the projected flood risk and flood deaths are greater than the projected in 2017. Uh, that is due to improvements in the modeling. Uh, we are confident that these are, are better projections than in 2017. Uh, as we just discussed, there are projects uh, in various levels of varying levels of planning and engineering that can significantly reduce this risk. Additionally, there are conceptual projects that we're evaluating for the master plan uh, that can further reduce this, this risk. Uh, and the other thing that I, I, I didn't stop and point out is the magnitude of the risk reduction systems in place are effective. So if we had gone back to the, the flood depth maps, the HISTRA system, if maintained as prescribed, uh, continues to be effective against the 1% uh, annual exceedance probability of flood depth. You see some uh, minor flooding inside the system that is rain driven. Uh, we do not see overtopping in our model. So uh, the, the uh, important takeaway is that the systems that we have are effective. Uh, next steps, uh, as we also just discussed, the future with action modeling is ongoing. Uh, and certainly as we, we get results, we'll make sure to, to share them with you in a, in a timely manner. Um, and lastly, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but we have a number of resources if you're interested in more of the mechanics of these models. Uh, we have both uh, uh, technical documents that, that may be quite dense, and then we have, uh, in, most, in most cases, uh, more accessible recorded presentations on uh, on uh, surge and wave modeling, on the risk modeling, and I said in most cases more accessible because I still can't quite wrap my head around the population modeling uh, stuff, but uh, uh, we have that available too for those that are, are interested in, in learning about this in more detail. All right, are there any questions? Thank you. When you're building the model, what do you assume on the storm? So uh, we start with a suite of 640 storms uh, that have a wide variety of, of physics associated with them. Central pressure, diameter, speed, uh, and track. And from those, we, we model all 640 storms. We then sunset all those storms because, um, sorry, just for computation and dollars, it is really expensive to run. 640 storms over and over again. Uh, we come up with a subset of 90 of those storms, it might be like 93, uh, of those storms that, that represent the flood depths of the greater suite. So we, we have storms that range from, uh, we, we don't use categories, but range from what we would consider like a, a, a five year storm or a, a fairly minor uh, tropical storm event uh, to really extreme storms, like a, a thousand years. And from that, uh, we develop a, a statistical likelihood of the flood depths produced, or the, the flood elevation produced by those um, So the answer so, is, so you're modeling storms from tropical storm crystal ball to hurricane island to or even greater, even greater than that. And so what we, the, the storms themselves are translated into those flood depth exceedances. And when we translate those into risk, the, the important thing is to understand that, that those thousand year storms, they come around really infrequently. So when we want to understand what damage they do, like we can, or we can tell what damage they do, but because we're coming up with an annualized value, we're multiplying that by 0 .0001. So the, the impact on our calculation is, is very modest. Whereas a very common storm, or a, 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 a more frequent storm, like a, a small tropical storm that comes around much more frequently, those produce much less damage, 
but they come around much more frequently. And so that's calculated into the, the, the estimate of damage as well. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> but the flood depths on your, on your, I think we're more going here, is the flood depths on your map, on your color-coded map there, that is taken into account the most extreme 1,000-year level storm, right? Yes. It exceeds the strength and the surge projection or that we experienced during high. Yes, but it's it's uh, statistically treated to like so. Actually, sometimes NOAA puts out projections that just have the full extent of, of flooding. This is statistically treated to understand or to, to estimate what the one percent exceedance flood depth. Mm -hmm. So while we have those in our system. Uh, it's a, we're not that is, that map is not what happens when we see a thousand year storm. That is what happens when there's one percent exceedance. All right, I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Stu, for your presentation. Um, have uh, in the terms of the economics of it all, like after we experienced um, Hurricane Ida all the storms we've had in the southwest that we our, our housing market increase is greatly increased. So is that taken into consideration through, I know you have a, like some formula, but are you pulling current records right now in certain areas? I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm assuming after Hurricane Ida, Oma area had the same exact thing happen like we did. There's uh, not a lot of housing available because so many structures were damaged, so the cost increased greatly. So how is that taken into effect? So that, we do not take that in, into account. We have uh, our, our uh, asset database, the pre-storm mm -hmm. asset database, and it's, it's intentional that we don't take that into account. So um, we, we, want, we don't want to skew based on a, a acute event that causes some, some shock in the system. So the comparison would be if we ran this with data from 2006, we would show very little damage in St. Bernard Parish because there would be very little to damage. But since then, it's been one of the fastest growing uh, parishes or counties in the country. And so uh, we, don't, we don't want to be overly responsive to uh, a single acute event as we're projecting out 50 years. Okay, I got that. Um, also, um, just on the end design of the 2023 uh, 20, master plan, are we going to have the one page handouts per parish broken out like we did last time? I thought that was really good and uh, very helpful to the citizens of Southwest Louisiana and the whole entire state. So, are we all planning on doing that again? We're absolutely planning on doing that. I talked about the, the 200 and some uh, communities that we have. We also have the ability, probably not as a paper handout, but to produce those for the individual communities. And, and hopefully we're developing a, a data viewer uh, that we'll certainly share with you all as we, we get it closer to, uh, to a public facing version. Um, but where you can aggregate that, you can say, I'm interested in these four communities, you can select those four right. communities and uh, it can have export statistics on, on those four communities. Okay, last question. Um, for the estimated damages, I'm sure it's, there's going to be some kind of statement in the master plan about how the Hindra system paid for itself through working properly to protect New Orleans. Um, having said that, and I'm grateful for that, uh, it kind of calls me calls uh, about Southwest Louisiana because um, had that large scale marsh creation and hydrologic project been on the ground during the Laura and those events, thank God they were wind events and not flood events as well. But my emergency button has been pushed about we got to get that project in, we got to get it in the ground, we got to protect all these. Vital assets, you know, we have $108 billion of LNG facilities still in it. And with everything happening in the world, that's really important right now. And so, my thing is, we need it yesterday, 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 since my rocket, rocket, rocket works. So, I'm going to go with yesterday, yesterday, yesterday money. 
So it's vitally important now, more so than ever, to get those projects in and on the ground as soon as possible, because you've shown what you've done to protect New Orleans, and it worked, thank goodness. But we're exposed over there in Southwest Louisiana, we need that done as soon as possible. So that's just kind of an idea. But also, here's the question, sorry. <coughs> Um, the question is that I've asked a couple of times is, I know with the sweeter storm, and we've asked a couple of times about back-to-back -back storms, and how that, that seems to happen in Southwest Louisiana, coming in, one on top of the other, and when the wet ones are damaged, the second storm had it been a flood event, it would have been devastating for us, even more so. So, what are we doing about that? Are we modeling them? Are we looking at that? Are the numbers increasing with that? Those kinds. So, as you've asked this question before, right. uh, we, we in the landscape modeling, we, we do have that dynamic uh, okay. in the landscape modeling. In the risk modeling, that's kind of a, a, a snapshot at year 10, 20, 30, 40, okay. 50. Um, but I guess to, to go back to your previous question slash statement, one thing we want to focus on in the, this master plan is having kind of region-specific outlines of, of region-specific needs and uh, the issues and some of the issues to, to address that. And uh, the back-to-back -back storms in terms of the overall economic damage uh, it is, doesn't necessarily fit in that analysis. However, in terms of response and recovery uh, and, and, uh, and you know, like how we actually manage those, that is a really important thing to, to try to identify. So, uh, it doesn't necessarily fit in a modeling construct, but it is really important for the, the recovery and response uh, agencies okay. to have in mind as, as uh, we think about what flood risk looks like in the future. Okay. Any other questions for Stu? I have one. I'll just talk about it. Uh, Stu, a, a great presentation, and, and I've been involved in the, in the master plans of 17 and on, and, and it seems like every time I've asked, have you considered this, or do you consider that, it, it, it's always been, it's in there. But I'm going to take another shot at it uh, for a, a particular reason. Um, in, in your presentation, you talk about sea level rise being regionally adjusted and subsidence by ecoregion, but I'm not exactly sure how granular the ecoregion is. But I know that um, the late Dr. Roy Daka uh, from LSU had shown that subsidence rates vary greatly uh, geographically. And uh, especially in our area of Lafourche and Terrebonne, we saw that there were subsidence rates higher by an order of magnitude as compared to some of the rates that NOAA traced on the USGS sites and stuff like that. My question being, because I'm, I'm in the process of trying to consider things that might be helpful for the Nicholas Coastal Center to do is that if we kind of uh, took off from where um, Dr. Daka left things uh, and he passed away like 11 years ago, um, I think it would be something that would allow some granularity to adjust the, for the subsidence rates year to year as we look at things further forward. I guess, would you think that that would, because that was one of the recommendations I made about use from the Nicholas Coastal Center, would you find that useful? Any, uh, any way we can reduce the uncertainty in subsidence rates is an improvement. We have made some really significant strides over the last five, six, seven years that we have been able to incorporate into the master plan. And so we do have much uh, higher resolution subsidence projections now than we did uh, previously, but it's uh, with all of this modeling, there's uncertainty in all of these environmental parameters, and any reduction in that uncertainty is uh, an improvement in the modeling. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got two requests, Stu, a so little we'll, we'll more for you. Um, I think it's important for us, Stuart, as a, as a board, as the agency that's leading this effort, that we, we have got to find a new way to communicate all of this great information in a less technical way. Because yeah. I'm looking around the room here tonight, it's clear to me that you fully, fully grasp all of this, that you know what you're talking about, but 
this is, is very technical information. And when we take this to the general public, yeah. it, it's going to scare the hell out of them. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not going to understand it. Yeah. And, and I'm not demeaning anybody's intelligence there. It's just it's very technical, very scientific information. Secondly, we have got to talk more about the fact that our projects are effective. Right. That we are putting all these doom and gloom scenarios out. It's very important for the public to understand the risk that they face if we do nothing or current conditions, but if fully implemented, all of the projects, what, what does that get us? And so I, I just think that that's very important that this agency continue to talk about that progress is being made, that the projects are effective, that they're reducing risk, that they're preventing flooding, and not just on sea level rise projections and flooding from a 1% event. Because if that's the way we're communicating, then that's the mindset that the public's going to be operating in, that we are in lost cause. And that is not the fact. And so we saw that, and you said that several times at the end of your presentation, that the projects are on the ground today, the way they performed against the strongest storm that ever hit the state, they were effective. And you had a much different picture on the ground following Ida than you did the previous strongest storm, even before Hurricane Laura. Uh, and so I just, those are two suggestions and, and takeaways that I think incredible work Incredible presentation, but I just think less technical, more on how our, our projects can be effective in standing up to all of these various environmental scenarios. So certainly, that that context is uh, is something we're focusing on in the, the development of, of the actual plan, and, and uh, we will uh, I will make sure to, to lead with that context <laughs> next time instead of throwing it at the end. But but we have. Uh, quite a few effective projects, both on the risk reduction side and on the uh, restoration side, that, that have have changed the trajectory uh, over the last five years and over the next ten years. That that, um, that we need to, to highlight, in addition to uh, showing these projected risk uh, outputs. Right. Great work. Appreciate you the team. Uh, and we're approaching the home stretch on this number, so if you think about it, this, is, this plan is going to be presented to the legislature next legislative session. So we would begin public meetings soon, probably in the when we're going to the public meetings, January. Time. Yes, we're, we're anticipating a kind of uh, public or community conversation uh, later this summer or fall, and then the official public meetings will be uh, later, late January. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Stu, very much. Uh, let's move on, members, to agenda item yeah. number. Sorry. Well, I'm trying to take my. Do you have a question, Mom? No, I know. It's just a comment. I think with the first grading 2.0, we were discussing this prior to the meeting. I think that it's really important to show all the successes that the CPRA has been making throughout these master plans. And was with, with, with the risk rating 2.0 having been implemented in April 1st, it's that much more. Thank you, Monica. Okay, agenda item number eight members is an update on the resilience and hazard mitigation related funding opportunities that the governor's office of homeland security. Okay, so Sandra. Sandra Dugan, the ghost up. I believe this is your first secret board meeting, Sandra, so well, welcome to the party.
some substantial drainage projects in the New Orleans and Acadiana regions. So I just wanted to recognize the continuing um, good mitigation that's going on and thank our, our state and local partners for that continued work. Um, moving forward into the recent funding as a result of the 2020 and 2021 events. Um, over the last two years, we've had seven presidentially declared uh, major disasters that have funneled hazard mitigation funding into the state. <clears throat> um, starting with Hurricane Laura and then Delta Beta, the winter weather, May floods, um, to include COVID, and then Hurricane Ida in 2021. Um, this, is, this has funneled over $700 million of additional mitigation money into the state. We're currently working with the parishes and state agencies to apply for that funding. Um, the application periods for all of those events are still currently open. Um, you can see the application period closed dates up there. Um, we continue to work with FEMA to request extensions to those application periods in 90 day increments so that we can continue to work to, to get um, those applications in. Um, we know that the FEMA application and approval process and then the implementation um, process for this mitigation is not fast, but it is effective. Um, we continue to work on the uh, what the non-federal share. So normally, hazard mitigation grant program funding is a 75-25 Fed non-Fed match. Um, legislation passed that makes all of the those disasters a 90-10 split, um, which is beneficial in that there's less of a local match required. Um, we continue to work with our local partners and Office of Community Development to see what that non-federal share funding may look like in terms of locally matching the disaster. Moving on to non-disaster projects, so, so HMGP is tied specifically to a presidentially declared disaster. Our non-disaster grants um, are now are comprised of BRIC and FMA. Um, fiscal year 2020 was the first year that we that BRIC was online and we applied for that funding. Um, there were over 29 projects submitted, but four were selected from that first round for Louisiana. Um, those four were a um, City of Slidell Coastal Master Plan, um, State Management Costs, Jefferson um, Bucktown Reinfrastructure, and then a Calcasieu um, Redundant Communications for their drainage pump systems. Um, so those are the projects that we're working on under the BRIC selections from 2020. Um, they were selected. That funding has not yet been awarded, but we continue to work with FEMA on that process. <clears throat> FMA, there were eight pro um, 18 projects selected there. And so the total project cost that's flowed into the state just from those two programs in 2020 is over $940 million. Um, fiscal year 2021, those projects that you see on the right there, they have been submitted and are still under FEMA review. Um, we anticipate that they would be, some of those will be selected for further review this year, um, likely to be awarded either this year or for next. Fiscal year 2022 FMA Swift Current. So this is a new initiative um, that FEMA is rolling out. Its purpose is to help speed up some of what that application process looks like. As we mentioned before, the, the FEMA application process is not generally fast. Um, and so this is an attempt to speed up some of that um, mitigation money. And so for this first round, there was 60, a total of 60 million that was allocated overall, and it was only allocated to four states, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Mississippi. And out of that 60, I'm sorry, 60 million. Out of that 60 million, Louisiana received 40 million of that allocation. Um, that includes a $36 million set aside for project costs, the actual mitigation work. The priorities are Ida impacted parishes, um, and this is going along with 
um, in order to meet the criteria set forth in FEMA's notice of funding opportunity. Um, we have put forth the criteria by which we will rank the sub-applications that we receive into the state by the, by the parishes and then for submission to FEMA. Um, and again, this is in accordance with their NOFO. The uh, primary priority will be substantially damaged properties that have um, a CPC uh, socio vulnerability index of 0 0.5001 or greater. The SD determination must have been made after 8-26-21. So those projects that are submitted to us that consist primarily of those properties will be ranked the highest. Followed by severe repetitive loss and repetitive loss properties. Um, obviously those also containing the CPC SVI criteria will be prioritized next. And then those that do not meet the criteria followed by other substantially damaged properties not meeting the SBI criteria. Um, there is flood insurance, so this is a flood mitigation assistance pro um, project or initiative, and so all properties must have had a current NFIP policy in effect um, at the time the application period opened, which was April 1st. This can include group flood insurance policies, though, um, not just the individual homeowner policies. GoSub's going to administer, administer this through two sub-application rounds. Yes, ma'am. What is a group policy? Can you explain that? It's, so, whereas the, the individual may go out and purchase a policy, right. there, are, there are instances where there may be a group policy based on the damages um, in a certain area that that um, I'm not sure exactly of all the specifics of how it works. It would it be like a subdivision? Uh, Why their policy as a group? Is that what you mean? Um, I, I don't think that's, I don't know if that's one of the ways that that can work. I don't think that's generally how, how it works, but it doesn't, um, it can be sort of that collaborative uh, okay. policy. And so we'll do um, two sub-application rounds with due dates of May 23rd and June 30th. The application deadline closes August 1st, and so this will give us an opportunity to um, receive the sub-applications from the local jurisdictions, review them, prioritize them, and then still get them to FEMA by the time the application period closes. Right now we are, um, doing some outreach to the local jurisdictions. We have a meeting set for tomorrow morning to go through the priorities with the parishes. Um, we intend to initially put a $4 million cap on those uh, individual sub-applications, at least for round one, so that we give an opportunity to sort of spread that money out. Um, and then we'll take stock at what, what we've received by May 23rd. Um, and then if there's still money left in the state allocation after that first round of applications, we'll open it up again and they can apply for that second round. And then there's been a lot of interest in the STORM Act, um, safeguarding tomorrow through ongoing risk mitigation act for, for the STORM Act. Um, the bill authorizes FEMA to enter into agreements with any state or go tribal government um, for the establishment of hazard mitigation revolving loans. Louisiana and, and other states are proactively putting forward um, proposed legislation to help create a framework to be able to implement those, that program and that, those funds when it comes online. Um, however, we don't really have a lot of detail from FEMA headquarters on what this is going to look like yet. The feedback that we've received is that they continue to work on the framework um, and anticipates implementation in late 2023. And that's actually all I have for you this morning. Um, I just wanted to, to make a comment to the the outline of the hazard mitigation and non-disaster funding that we have flowing into the state. Um, just as we see that these coastal restoration projects are effective, the hazard mitigation projects um, 
are not fast, but they are effective, and we've seen the result of that after the, the 2020 and 2021 storms. Those structures that were mitigated, rebuilt, repaired, um, hardened, fared substantially better in those events than those that, that were not mitigated. Um, and so we continue to advocate for those residential acquisition, elevation, reconstruction uh, projects, the drainage projects, safe rooms, and critical facilities retrofit projects that, that we've um, traditionally seen in addition to the, the newer green infrastructure projects that, that we've seen begin to make a difference in the state as well. So, Sam, thank you very much for being here. Just a couple of comments maybe or questions. So, I heard you in your, in your last few comments there talk about residential structures, retrofitting facilities, talk a little bit about green infrastructure. Can you talk a little bit more about what types of projects are eligible for this, this type of funding? When you talk about the SWIFT, I believe the SWIFT current, the FMA SWIFT current, I'm assuming that's for individual residents that can apply for these grants, correct? It, it is, yes, sir, it is for residential structures, but it, the applications have to flow through the parish. Right, okay. But and the parish is submitting on, on the residents' behalf, yes. correct? Okay, it, it, where, where I'm going with this is obviously $40 million in the SWIFT, but the more important one on the STORM Act or on any other hazard mitigation funding. In my mind, what better hazard to mitigate than someone's flood risk? Right. And so home elevations are important, retrofitting facilities are important, but we need to be looking for opportunities within the coastal master plan exactly. for projects right. that can fit the criteria of these funding programs. And so right. I know we've spent a lot of time in recent months coordinating between CPRA and DOSEF on grip funding, right. but I, I would just ask, I don't think I need a motion for this, but I would just ask Mr. Hawes, Mr. Grady, and the agency staff to, to begin coordinating with you and DOSA on where our projects that reduce flood risk can fit into these funding opportunities. Is that? Absolutely. And I'm going to I'm actually going to make the same comment to Mr. Mr. Haley on OCD funding opportunities for CDBG funds. You know, where, where can those funding opportunities overlay with the priorities in, in the master plan? So, just like to see a little bit more coordination collaboration between our, our respective agencies on this. Absolutely. So, they thank you. Yeah, sure. any, any questions for Ms. Duden? I have one. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about the banking industry, and um, I'm sure homeless deal with the same thing we have in southwest Louisiana, but um, we're having situations where we're trying to acquire properties that have been badly damaged, and not only are we um, dealing with a uh, DOB issue, but we're also dealing with um, an insurance issue now, and we're having problems with um, houses specifically that the insurance industry is not really sure what we're doing. So my question to you is, have y'all uh, contacted the insurance industry, banking industry, whatever, to try to figure out what the best path forward is? Because if you don't, there's an issue there. I had one house that sat for about three or four months until the banking industry needed to decide what to do, whether they could release the insurance funds so we could close on a house because they were hanging on to it. So there's a huge hole there. And I'm just wondering, A, have y'all discussed that with them? Because they're not wanting to release insurance money for us to buy a house until, um, until you know, until things are worked out. So it's been a real clog in the system. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, have y'all have y'all thought about that? Have you dealt with banking? And right. The the insurance issue has been more of an issue yeah. in the last year or so. Um, typically, what happens though is that the the homeowners.
sort of know what they're dealing with when they go into an application um, at the, the parish or city level and then comes to us. Um, there's usually not a lot of question on the DOB as far as what's left to come into that. And so those are details that if they're in an application and are submitted to GOSAP and FEMA for review and approval, the DOB piece can continue to be worked out as we move through the process. So they can be approved in an application and we can continue to work through that. We, we don't have to have all the answers to that up front. They'll, right. But um, I just, I'm just wondering if we could, in the future, if the storms keep coming like they're coming, we're going to eventually need a path forward on how to maneuver through that insurance aspect of it. I agree. I agree. I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you right. on that. But it does need to be a bigger part of the conversation because we need to be able to establish those amounts so that we know what we can pay. Right. Yeah, I, think, I, I, just, I think what Christina would go said, I think what we can do with Sandy and her team in case they are director of the office is just meet with them. Right. That's just educating them right. on the opportunities, on the process, I think partnering with them and, and Ahead of yeah, yeah that. that's 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 my question. It's just if that's one less thing we have to worry about in the future, and it doesn't clog down, <coughs> slow down an acquisition. We're heading along, moving along. After tomorrow, I won't be worrying about this, but I'm just trying to plan to see that this is a problem and it needs to be taken care of because we're going to have the core coming in, you know, doing the Southwest Coastal, and we just need to work through all these kinks as we move forward. We'll take Thank you. All right, any more questions, comments? I'll do. You know, I, I just piling on with, with, with Chip's talking about, about uh, working with the agency and working the master plan. And again, this would go for the Office of Community Development Program as well. When I look at the things up there, I see FEMA's mindset, severe repetitive loss, you know, those type of things. And FEMA has had the habit of working in a stovepipe type situation, right? They don't recognize the fact that the less money that you can elevate 10 houses, you can protect through structural flood protection 100 houses, right? We've never been able to breach that barrier with working with FEMA because they say, well, that's not our responsibility. That is a core responsibility or that is a NRCS responsibility. I think that as we consider how to spend this money and the next money we're talking about in the other one, having the power of the state's Office of, of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, making those statements to FEMA and getting them to recognize that, you know, elevating a home that still has flooding on the ground under it is not the ultimate solution, right? I mean, your house is fine, your stuff's fine, but your car's flooded, you can't get to your house and you can't get emergency services. So I think it's time that we rethink how we step through this process of getting large Delta item money and really try to put a focus on getting the federal government to understand that our sets of priorities based off of what we know and need on the ground and our projects from the uh, state's master plan is the right way to spend this money to, to get the most bang for the buck. And I just encourage that as much as you can. Thank you. Couldn't agree more, Mr. Rudolph. Thank you for that comment. Any other comments for Mr. Yep. <laughs> so um, it's kind of off topic, but when on the public charts it shows the non federal share of the Castagos, and I just want to uh, give the governor and the commissioner kudos for building into our supplemental bill this year and the budget for next year, we're trying to, at this point, pay down as much debt, not just the HISRA um, system, but for all of the non-federal share that GOSA uh, has to manage, because if we don't do it, then it becomes a liability in future years, which leaves less money available for other situations as they occur. So, at one point, we were up to about $450 million for GOSAP that we have put in the budget in order to help them eliminate negotiating with FEMA for payment plans. And we're trying to do everything we can while we have the money to um, have the state in a better posture. 
for years forward. So, Christina, I don't know where they are now, but I, I think that's where we started. And it most, it's mostly uh, public assistance funding. There's about, I think, 20 million, 20 to 25 million in hazard mitigation, old hazard mitigation, close out. But uh, most of it is all the old public assistance grants, cost sharing, and some of the new recent disaster cost shares that we're part of. CDBG funds, that's Community Development Block Grant funds from HUD, we typically do not receive those funds immediately after a disaster. You'll notice that it's, it wasn't until September of 2021, so just some six months ago, um, that Congress actually passed a, a, into law uh, a $5 billion uh, recovery fund for the disasters of 2020 and 2021. When that happens, uh, the state still doesn't have access to those funds. The next step that takes place is that HUD is the federal agency that administers those funds, and they're responsible to allocate a certain amount of the 2020 and 2021 disasters to Louisiana, along with all the other states that had an impact on the disaster. If that took place in October of 2021, uh, HUD uh, issued a allocation of $600 million and that was specifically for the disasters of Hurricane Laura and Delta. Uh, still doesn't give us access. The next thing that we wait on from HUD is what we call the Federal Register Notice. That's the rules that the Office of Community Development will receive from them that allows us to create an action plan to know how we are able to spend the funds. HUD released that action plan, uh, the Federal Notice, in January 31 of this year. So that really was our starting point. You'll notice that uh, our office was proactive and the same day we opened up a survey, and I'm going to talk more about that for homeowners, so that they could start to uh, begin that process of applying for these funds. In February of 21, we actually, a few weeks later, we put the action plan out for public <coughs> office. That's the next step. We're required to do that. We go all over the state doing just what we're doing here in public hearings, and we share with them about the action plan for 30 days before we can actually submit it to HUD. In March, uh, some things changed a little bit. Good for the state. HUD came back, I told you, they had $5 billion. When they first did that allocation in October, they only allocated about half of it. They came back in March of this year, so just a month ago, and they, they sort of what they call upscaled the Laura Delta allocation from the $600 million. They added another $450 million, so bringing us to a total of about a billion dollars. They also have all allocated $1.27 billion for Hurricane Ivan. Uh, that's where we stand right now with the allocation. We do not have, as I said, we don't have the Federal Register notice for Ida yet to be able to either write an action plan and submit one to HUD. Uh, we took what we've already had prepared for Laura and Delta, we changed some things in the budget, and on April 1st, we revised our action plan, we put it back out for public comment, and the 30-day expiration is coming up May 1st. So we are right now currently in a, a public comment period where we're receiving that and meeting with different stakeholders all over the state on that action plan. Uh, once we receive those May 1st, what we will do then is we take those, those comments that we receive, we have to respond to those, they are part of the action plan, we submit that to HUD, and then at that point, um, we wait on them to approve. We are 
anxiously waiting on that hopeful HUD does not have a timeline to be able to do that that's important for folks to know I will say that based on our action plan if you looked at it we modeled it much after the action plan from the 2016 floods which HUD approved so we have every anticipation to believe that uh, it would be a much faster process and that uh, we will get approval of that which will allow us to summer of this year to actually start having access to the funds and being able to implement our programs. So that's a little bit of the process and, and the timeline. This is just to show you, as, as uh, colleagues have already mentioned, the different disasters that we were impacted by as a state. But you can see here where the funding is right now, at least through CDBG dollars. Uh, we have about a billion dollars for Laura and Delta, 1.2 for Ida, and we also received a $10 million allocation for the, the winter storm. There was no HUD, see, I'm, I'm sorry, not for the winter storms, for um, the flooding in May. We did not receive any funding for the winter storms or for Hurricane Zeta. This kind of just breaks down a little bit. We've been sharing this in the Lake Charles area. It's uh, impactful for us. We do do studies when we're planning the action plan. Uh, one thing that I'll just note here is you'll see that renters had a higher percentage of, of damage and people that were impacted than homeowners. That's normally not the case. I've been doing this since Katrina Rita. You typically see it's more homeowners, but uh, it it's, was almost 50-50 with, with renters being slightly higher. The other thing that I'll point out on this um, slide that's important as we talk about our programs and as you're hearing questions is the money that HUD allocates is based on an analysis they do of FEMA IA data, individual assistance. They are looking for unmet needs and they base that on what they call major severe. So if they do not provide funding through CDBG dollars for those that were impacted with, say, minor damage. And so you can see in the homeowner uh, category here, there's 6,300 in the Laura Delta area that uh, had major severe classification of damage, while 12,000 had minor. Our fund, we have to demonstrate in the action plan, we're required to meet the need of those major severe. And so as you start to hear about different rules, I just want some, some of our folks to understand that. The next thing is the budget. This is probably one of the important things you want to see just to, to project and show you. This is what we have in the action plan right now. This, this all adds up to that billion dollars for Laura Delta. You will notice that it is very heavy on housing. There are three major requirements that HUD typically gives the state that we have to comply with. One, we have to demonstrate that we spend and we fund all of our funds to meet the housing need first. The second thing that they typically require and is in the notice is that 70% of that billion dollars, so over 700 million, has to have a direct impact for those households that are considered low to moderate income. And then the, the third category that we have to work in, those rules that we work in with the, the billion dollars, is 80% of the dollars, so over 800 million, has to go to what HUD declares as the MIDs, the most impacted and distressed parishes. And so they take all the parishes that um, had the federal uh, disaster declaration by the president, they do their analysis, they, they bring that down and they say these are the MIDs. And so like Calcasieu and Cameron are, are in, in the MIDs for Laura and Delta. The, the homeowner program has, which we call the Restore program, has $300 million in there. There's a few other uh, million dollars and 500,000 that complement that program. It's basically to help those homeowners be in compliance with insurance needs and while their homes are being repaired to have some assistance. You'll see the next thing is really hitting, I told you, over 50% were in renters that were impacted. So there's a significant amount of money that goes into helping to sustain affordable housing. We have an affordable housing crisis in, in our state um, and the storms only exasperate that. And so what we do is you'll see that uh, we, we put money in different um, programs that have been quite successful with uh, OCD over the years. Uh, and just to highlight a couple, Saw Seconds is to help, really it's uh, to help renters become homeowners. So it takes them out of the rental. Uh, middle market loan and our neighborhood landlord, they're more geared at uh, your mom and pops that uh, <coughs> damage um, small businesses that want to build and, and rehab 
damaged structures, and then what the state is getting out of that is the requirement for them is to provide those, when those um, buildings come online, they have to provide those at affordable housing for the low to moderate income. And then the piggyback is our, our, our next one that is a one that is um, complemented with uh, tax credits, and that is for your larger developers that go in and actually build new, safer, stronger um, rental uh, housing that's a lot of times mixed housing. So they will commit to provide so much as a percentage of it to low to moderate income. The next thing on the right, uh, is it's been mentioned, Mr. Chairman, you've mentioned it a couple of times, so I want to highlight it here, is what the state does is, uh, from OCD standpoint, we have the ability to be able to match that public, that PA and the HMGP match that we've talked about. That a lot of times those projects in our, our local jurisdictions can't get underway because they don't have the 10% match. Um, and so one thing that we're able to do with our dollars is to do that. So we do already, we have been working with GOSEP to get their numbers. Uh, the PA match here, we have 150 million in the budget. It does not cover 100% of the match. It covers a significant portion, but as, as Ms. Goodson mentioned, the, the good part is, is that the state is also working with the commissioner and governor to be able to budget funding for the state PA programs. So this is going to allow us to put all of our math at the local jurisdictions. Uh, one of our challenges, this is the first time we've not been able to do 100%, and a lot of that has to do with that regulation I mentioned earlier, about 70% of the funds have to go and demonstrate an LMI objective. Typically, your PA projects don't. And so you, you look at our budget, we, have, we can't submit an action plan to HUD that doesn't show that we are projecting at least $700 million to benefit low to moderate income. So that's kind of our, our limitation there. The second thing is we work with GOSET to sort of see what's on the table for those HMGP programs. We don't really get involved in that as much. They follow their plans and they work with the local jurisdictions. Where we're able to complement that is we can go ahead and budget the 10% match um, for those local jurisdictions. And so that represents currently what we've heard from Laura and Delta would be the need to cover 100% match on those HMGP projects. Last thing that I, I want to mention is I, I said earlier in the program um, that we had uh, our Restore Louisiana Homeowner Assistance Survey started in January. If you know the people that were impacted by Laura Delft or even Ida, we want to encourage people to go do the survey. Uh, they're able, it takes about 10 minutes to do it. There's nothing they have to upload. We've uh, had a lot of success in the floods of 2016 the software did not allow you to be able to do it with a mobile device on your phone. Um, being able to do that now has made it so much easier and opened it up for homeowners to be able to just go onto their phone, be able to uh, take the survey. That's the first step to get into the program. They have to do that, and so we want to encourage them to do that. There is a number up here that if they just don't have the ability to do that, we have a call center where they can call, and uh, we can actually do the survey for them. And then here's some information where you can make contact as well if you have uh, direct questions or you want to make a public comment about the action plan. Again, that ends on May 1st, and we will anticipate submitting that to HUD. The last comment I'll make is that uh, you may be wondering is we are waiting. I talked to some HUD officials yesterday to get the notice for Ida. As soon as we get that, we are already working and writing the action plan so that we will be able to hopefully turn that around within a few days and have that out for public comment. So, thank you. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Haley, for the presentation and for being here today. It sounds like that you guys are being very forward in the attempt to comply with all of the regulations and procedures that govern CDBG funds, but this, this comment is not directed at you uh, or, or OCD, but any time there are federal funds that are coming to Louisiana for disaster-related activities, it's, it's a good thing. But I cringe every time that I see Congress continue to appropriate 
first, right out of the gate, CPG funds. Because the, the process to get CDBG funds on the ground is bureaucratic. The rules, the procedures, the regulations that govern these funds, they're ridiculous. And that's not something that you can, that OCD is responsible for, but now, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna sound like I'm too CPRA's support here, but we have spent a lot of time and energy in Washington, D.C. getting some pretty game-changing bills and authorizations in federal legislation. From interest payback, from regulatory reform, getting projects authorized, I would just suggest that we really work with our congressional delegation on how we can tweak the regulations at the federal level to get these funds on the ground faster. It's just, it's, and I don't agree with nobody, nobody, nobody objects with you on that. I think it is important that uh, we, we understand just legislation. It, it, we have to change legislation, please. But uh, there is what, what the law calls a sequence of funding. And so obviously that first sequence in a disaster is those homeowners that are impacted and have insurance. The second and the first uh, really federal funds is your FEMA funds, then your SBA funds, and then CDBG funds. CDBG funds are always third in that sequence, and so that's why you're always going to see them later than, than sooner. They're not going to typically, Congress isn't going to appropriate those funds until after FEMA dollars have gone out and they have made a determination whether or not there's still an unmet need or not. That's why when you saw the slide earlier that they decided that there was no appropriation for Zeta or for the winter storms because they said that the FEMA dollars and the SBA covered it. It's only after that and that analysis that CDBG even comes to the table. But you're, you're right, that's not something that our office, we're thankful that we receive the money as the state, but it is more of a congressional I would just like to get your ideas though, on provisions that we could change in federal statutes that would allow for our state or all these local parishes to get their hands on these dollars faster. You're right that it's going to take action from Congress, but it's not something you've got to give. Well, I, I would say our governor worked very diligently as well as our, our commissioner. We prepared, we worked with GOSAP. Right after Laura Delta, we started doing the analysis and went up to Cong you know, went up to DC month after month trying to get this appropriation that sadly took over a year. I mean, you guys saw that. That's why we showed that timeline. Again, we're not going to put anybody on the bus, but it's not until September 2021 that we even have a public law that's going to appropriate dollars um, for the disaster. Uh, well, um, if, if you can go back to that slide that said more Delta impact, I'd like to just bring everybody a little bit up to speed on what is happening. Uh, this right here. Yes. So just imagine that you're back in your home and Laura and Delta has slammed into it and brought your neighbor's house into your house now. And uh, you're provided a travel trailer to live in. And then you go through a winter storm, actually a polar vortex is what I'm told it is, in a travel trailer. And then you're in your travel trailer and then you have a flood that floods your travel trailer and then your two vehicles. And then you're in your travel trailer new addition and you get COVID and they tell you to go home and quarantine in your travel trailer with your husband and three kids. And then you get to fight and hopefully live through COVID with your quarantine travel trailer situation. And then you get to fight with your insurance companies over and over again. Many of my friends are in this situation. We had Laura hit in August of 2020. It's rolling into August of 2022. They have been in a travel trailer for two solid years. Let me just say, when you travel through Lake Charles, please be kind to these people. I'm sure Mr. Bruce or Mr. Sigmar can tell you, we're at our limit. So 
So I, I, I'm sorry that all this money is taking so long to come down, but I would like to see the head of whatever agency living in a travel trailer for two years going through what we've been through in Southwest Louisiana. So I'm begging you and this board and everybody else to please, please, please work together. We know all of these projects are resilient and they'll work. There is no excuse whatsoever why the citizens of Southwest Louisiana have had to endure what we've had to do for two solid years. No, no reason why that you can explain to me how that happens in the United States of America. I'm sorry, things have got to be different. Everybody should be working together to put these master plan projects where they belong. And every rule and everything that we've done in the past is not working. If you think about the, the emotional damage that has occurred, everyone at GOSEP, everyone at HUD, everyone, I want you to put yourself in a travel trailer for two years with five people and two dogs and think about that for a minute. No, oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's point well taken. We go all over, of course, we've been there, and you need to listen. That's why we do public comment, right? You need to listen to, to the people that we serve. We are trying to be as proactive of getting these programs where they're, they're ready to go. I, I cut down my slides a lot, right, to five minutes, but I had a great slide. I was now going to add it that does show that impact that uh, the Lake Charles area, uh, Shoe Bears and Cameron, they're, they're the only two, I believe, they're making that bow guard that actually were impacted by four of the five federally declared disasters, you know, when you look at the state. And so um, it's, it's, that's a, a picture just to show you sort of what they, what they uh, had to endure. It's yeah, just not acceptable. It it's not months. acceptable. I mean, it's not acceptable. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, once again, I, I, not to put, well, Chip kind of touched on it. I'm going to put a, a much finer point on it, right? In, in the case here where the HUD CDGB stuff comes out, uh, the process is broken, purely is broken. It's not your guy's responsibility. You have to follow that guidance. You have to step through that process, and we understand it. It seems like you're as Johnny on the spot about it all as you can, but the process is broken. From this agency's uh, perspective and the things that we do, I'll give you an example of Gomesa, right? Gomesa's broken. It doesn't do everything we have. So we're up there. We're talking to our legislators. We're trying to make fundamental changes to the processes that are in Gomesa. My question to you, is anyone at, the, you know, at your office, community development, basically having a consorted effort to go to D.C. to change the HUD process? And if not, what would that involve, and how would you get around to do it? I think that happens all the time, yes. Um, remember, OCD is under the Division of Administration, so that's the agency, and the agency is quite active in trying to do that. As I said, I mean, as soon as the disaster hit, our, our governor was up there. Yeah, um, and, and, his, yeah. and to his credit, I'm the trying to get the money. But I'm talking about, talking about to change sure. HUD's process. Right. Is there anything going on in that regard? You know, we work with them on our action plans and things. Some of the some of the rules of the 70% LMI, the 80% mid. I mean, those are more at a federal level that yeah, we're not being able to make an impact. Uh, as Mr. Chairman said, one of the reasons CBG dollars are used, while it does have a lot of rules to it, um, many years ago it was put in place with Katrina Reader because it was seen as the fastest way to get the funds out. And today, when you talk with legislature and others, I know we don't want to hear that, but there's not another source or place for Congress to appropriate money to get it to states. And so that's, you know, kind of yeah, where we are. And, and I agree. And it's, it's, it's third in the group, and it's what's there. It's what probably makes some of the, it's some of the bigger money, and it makes some of the most, uh, the biggest long-term mitigating impact. 
the problem is the timing of it all. And I know you're stepping through it, and, and I think the government's done a great job of going up there and making sure that we get the money in the pipeline. But the pipeline needs to be fixed. Exactly. Right? And that's what I think we need to see if, look, I'm not just saying that I've been up to D.C. a bunch of times. If there's anything I can do or anyone in this group can do to help the Office of, of Community Development work on a way to get our legislators to figure out how to change that HUD pipeline, I'm a lot out of my element on that, right? But there's ways we can make sure that we can we can try to improve that pipeline. Um, I, I point well taken. I think we, that and uh, the thing that you all mentioned, it's been, it's been great for me to be here just to listen as we work together, not only when we get the money, but then to make sure we use the money in such a way that the next disaster hits, we don't have this kind of impact. Um, you know, I, one of the things that we do with that crime program is we're requiring uh, those that uh, apply for that NOVA to build to a certain standard um, above building codes. We use um, resilient standards, we're using IDHS, um, and they're fortified gold and silver. We have a project, um, as Mr. Chairman was saying, we don't tell ourselves to say it enough. There was a project down in Terrebonne Paris, Les Maison, that had just finished before Ida hit. And after the storm, those residents were able to move back in within less than a week and very little damage compared to everybody around them. So it does show these resilient measures that we're all talking about today work. And so as we get the funds, we need to invest in that way so that these disasters are going to keep coming, unfortunately, right? I mean, that's not something we control. Um, but as they come, the stronger and more resilient we build, the, the less impact that we'll see. So just to piggyback on what Mr. Bourgeois was talking about, Mr. Haley, is the problem isn't the state getting the money or an amount of money that's going to be ultimately coming to the state. The problem is the, the rules that govern getting the funding actually <coughs> on the ground to actually start turning dirt on a project or to an individual homeowner. And so Mr. Bufo mentioned our, our efforts related to GoMesa. So there is a GoMesa Revenue Sharing Coalition that we're taking a trip, I believe, at the beginning of, of June, where last time we went up, we met with over 80 members of Congress on this. So I, I would just ask that maybe you, Mr. Forbes, or others, representatives of OCD, maybe just give us a few suggestions on things that we can talk to members of Congress about. Say, hey, can, can we look at tweaking this process I mean, you mentioned action plans. And action plan approvals and public comment. Sure. Public comment is approved. Public engagement is, is important. But lots the majority of just like as far leading as the governor's being and the business administration's being and making sure that we're on sound financial footing and doing everything we can to get the dollars allocated. The number of times you mentioned process and regulations and rules. In your presentation, and this is not directed at OCD, but you're complying with the regulations that Congress and federal government are putting on you. That's where the frustration comes in. So, having lived in Washington, all of us kind of started in Katrina with uh, the HUD money coming, and they shifted, you know, the federal government shifted out of kind of health states through these types of disasters. I think, I mean, this is California has to deal with it, the West. Fires. I mean, all, all states have to deal with it from different circumstances, but in just listening to this conversation, I think the first thing that we as the state have to do is we have to get, as you said, get ahead of it. And the only way to get ahead of it is to try to have plans ready. We have plans ready from the parishes or local communities on a worst case scenario. If something happens, this may be what we would do to, to start to rebuild because it's that planning process. They have to go through an action, you know, action plan that really uh, takes a lot of time. Keep in mind, it was a year after the storm before anything was allocated, which you know, we had never had to deal with that type of scenario before either. But I think if we can um, figure out a way from the local community through the state to have plans action plans ready of uh, uh, steps that could be taken, we might can improve the whole process. What do you think, Lori? I think so. <laughs> I mean, it's obviously not working. I mean, 
you know, other than my plan to put whoever's in charge in a travel trailer for two years, which I think would be hysterical to video, and that might be a new Netflix thing to do. But um, if we have any media producers in here, please, please consider that because really and truly, I'm not sure how long the people in Southwest Louisiana can hang on waiting for you guys to figure out how the money needs to flow down, you know, and how, but what we know, it's broken and it needs to be fixed. I don't care how, when, or where, it just needs to be fixed. We cannot go through this again, ever again, in any place in Louisiana. Not acceptable. Well, on Ms. Gibson's point, you would, you would think that there would be a lot of sympathetic ears around the country for this process. I mean, Barbara mentioned the wildfires, you think about the tornadoes in Tennessee and other parts of the country, the extreme weather events, the, even the flooding in the Northeast as a result of Idaho. I mean, all of these other states and local municipalities are having to go through the same process. So it might just take Louisiana to leave the area. Yeah. No. No. All right, any other questions or comments from Mr. Mr. Haley? All right. Thank you, Mr. Haley. Thank you for the loud discussion. Uh, let's see, members, we're going to move on to item number 10. We're going to get a quick legislative session update from Mr. Caffrey in the governor's office, which will be followed by an update from Mr. McMillan on IIJA and some of our efforts at the DC level. Chairman and members, uh, I know yes. uh, no presentation. Okay. I'm always Inger's favorite because she doesn't have to do anything for me. So <laughs> um, we're tracking right at 160 bills right now, but the nearly 1,805 per session this year. Um, the budget and capital outlay and all the fund bills are scheduled for a special order on the House floor tomorrow afternoon, um, or should be tomorrow. As an update on HB2 and our surplus request, uh, we weren't able to get the full 150 million as we originally hoped. However, you know, we're certainly still working on that as the bill uh, makes it over to the Senate. We'll, we'll continue to work it. Um, currently, in HB2, though, we do have 120 million in surplus. Um, we're hopeful. We're hopeful to get some of that reduction back uh, in the P5 on HB2 on the um, Senate side. As for our legislation, um, HCR 34, by Representative Boria, the uh, FY23 CPR annual plan has made it through both uh, House Natural Resources and House Transportation and is waiting to be heard on the House floor. House Bill 157 by Representative Boria, that's our uh, tax sale title bill, um, passed the House 99 0 and since has been referred to the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Hopefully, I was talking to uh, Brian yesterday, hopefully we'll get that bill heard in Senate Natural Resources next week whenever they start taking up um, House bills. Uh, and, and I can certainly dive in, into these bills and more if anybody has any questions. I'm just kind of running through the list. Um, House Bill 636 by Representative Ogeron, that's our constitutional amendment to dedicate uh, offshore alternative energy revenues to the Coastal Trust Fund. Uh, 636 has passed uh, House Appropriations and House Civil Law and currently sits on the House calendar for consideration. Um, 687, House Bill 687 by Representative Ogeron, as well as the statutory language for the constitutional amendment, but it also, uh, by statutory dedication, dedicates any state uh, alternative energy revenue specific specifically in the coastal area the coastal trust fund as well um, that bill is on the house calendar for the floor later on today if anybody wants to make their way to the capitol this afternoon and talk to their uh, house member uh, senate bills senate bill 91 by senator henskins this is the legislation to recreate the cpra it is three quarters way through the process and is uh, Pending in House Natural Resources. Uh, current, oh, excuse me, uh, it's passed uh, House Natural Resources and sits on the House calendar waiting to be heard on the floor. Senate Bill 91 was actually moved yesterday. Um, 
and natural resources. Since our last meeting, um, the only new bill that, that we had filed was Senate Bill 465 by Senator Kine. This bill transfers the custodian of record uh, duty of the SLIFA nominating committees to the regional directors for each respective flood authority. Simply, this legislation just removes uh, the CPRA board chairman as the custodian of record for the nominating committees and makes the SLIFA regional directors the custodians for, for their uh, nominating committees. As for bills we're watching, uh, House Bill 97 by Representative McGee, which removes the sunset for levy restoration or uh, rehabilitation work not publicly bid. The window of cure-all law it is scheduled for uh, House floor later this afternoon. Uh, House Bill 165 by Z and Representative Ogeron, which establishes the wind leasing acreage and revenue sharing for the state wind, uh, excuse me, for the state for wind energy, passed the House 9210 and has since been referred to Senate Natural Resources. House Bill 221 by Representative McGee, which increases the various purchasing limits for materials for levy district. Levy districts has passed the House 930 and has been transferred, excuse me, has been referred to uh, Senate Transportation. House Bill 519 by Representative Garfala which implements uh, cost share provisions for the slip list in that payment for joint cost be apportioned by mutual agreement of the districts and parishes uh, has been scheduled for House Transportation uh, next Monday. House Bill well, that, while we're on that one, I saw some communication from President McGinnis to um, Representative Garofalo, who was also in Blue Bear Cantrell, and President Duchesne, that had asked for that bill to be deferred. Okay. And I believe that that plan plan in place right now is for Mayor Cantrell, President Bichain, and President McGinnis to come up with some concepts for us to consider um, which could be presented or folded into legislation next year. The parishes are going to take the lead on that bill as it relates to the flood authority and which we were just saying. Okay, great. Senate Bill 3 by Senator Hotman is the bill to create the framework for the distribution of money related to enforcement actions with coastal use permits. Um, that passed the Senate 320 and has since been referred to House Appropriations. If you all recall, this is the, the same legislation as uh, Senator Hotman filed last year, and the structure is the structure contemplated in Senate Bill 3 this year is the same structure as, as last year was. 75% of any settlement would go to CPRA and 25% would go to local government provided that uh, the funding is used for integrated coastal protection. Senate Bill 292 by Senator Hewitt. Um, the bill that would require specific legislative approval before DEQ or any state agency or department could attempt to regulate greenhouse gas emissions or implement anything uh, climate action plan uh, still waits to be scheduled and heard in the Senate Environmental Quality Committee. That's, that's still in its originating committee. Um, and then finally, the last bill that I want to uh, hit on today is Senate Bill 640, excuse me, 463 by uh, Senator White and Senator Foyle. This legislation would create the Coastal Area Flood Protection Authority new state agency focused on providing flood protection and coastal restoration for parishes and portions of the parishes north of the coastal zone, but in the coastal area, as well as the contiguous areas subject to storm and tidal surge and rivers. This legislation creates a new chapter in Title 49, establishes a purpose and legislative intent, provides for definitions, creates the Coastal Area Flood Protection Board, creates the Coastal Area Flood Protection Authority, Change, uh, excuse me, charges the board with developing a master plan, annual plans that are subject to legislative approval, and creates the Coastal Area Flood Protection Fund. So it is, it is very similar model to uh, CPRA and the work that we do, but it is focused on an area that CPRA has jurisdiction for it. So I want to hit on two uh, bills that you did. So I was also want to maybe in your favor of not having an actual presentation. I was asking for future meetings, and we do at least have a one major bills that we're tracking. So we're going to have that handy. 
Uh, I wanted to touch on the surplus uh, funding that, that Russell mentioned. Do you recall it was two weeks ago now that the governor at Coastal Day announced $150 million in surplus funding for hurricane protection and coastal restoration projects. So we were cut in the house originally down to $108 billion. Uh, and then the bill that was came out of the House Appropriations yesterday allocated $120 million to CPRA. And so between the 108 and 120, there was some projects that were added for Iberia Parish and then some additional funding to cover the increase in cost of the Bayou Lagoon Freshwater Pump Station. And so while we're still fighting for the $150 million of cash, what, what we're planning to do is there is a marsh creation project that was $38 million in South Lafouche that is not ready for construction this fiscal year. And so we're going to put money in. We still have money in, in cash and surplus to finish the engineering and design on that project. And then we'll be you know, working on the Senate side to make sure that the money for the construction of that project is put in P5. And that way next year we can roll that forward in the P1, um, hopefully by working with the division and, and the, the legislators. So while it's not 150 million in cash that the governor announced, uh, we've got 120 million in cash and the, the portion of the uh, marsh creation in South Lafouche, the construction portion will be in P5, uh, hopefully in the Senate. So all, all in all, while it's not 150 million in cash total that the governor has made it very clear to me that that's what he has announced and that's what he expects us to fight for, which we are. Uh, I think at the end of the day, we're going to be okay as far as our surplus money. And then secondly, uh, Russell mentioned the, the bill by Senator White that creates the Coastal Carrier Protection Authority. So <laughs> that should get everybody's attention in this room. And so Senator White feels that there's not enough priority given to the coastal area areas outside of the coastal zone, so areas of Livingston, portions of East Baton Rouge, West Baton Rouge for flooding type projects. And so as Russell just said, the CPRA already has jurisdiction over the coastal area. Obviously our efforts over the last several years are focused on the most vulnerable areas that are most at risk from surge, that have the highest rates of land loss in South Louisiana. And so Statewide flood control still resides in DOT. Uh, there is an effort of $1.2 billion of watershed funding that there will be a lot of portion will be going to the coastal area parishes, particularly in the coastal region. But creating a coastal area authority completely trips over the mission of this agency. So there was a committee hearing, uh, was it yesterday? My days are running together. Uh, we are here in front of Senate Finance, and uh, Senator White has, has not moved the bill out of the committee, but it is clear that his frustrations with coastal area flooding projects. And so we're just going to continue to work with him to hopefully get him to understand that there's a better way to approach this issue than creating another entity that has very similar responsibilities and authorities that CPRA already has. So those are just, just two highlights that I wanted to mention, and then also our annual plan continues to get uh, a lot of praise in the legislature. As well as said, we're going through two committees now in the full house for its approval, which is, um, seems to be moving right along. But appreciate it, uh, Mr. Nick Pally having Mr. Nick's still here. There he is. Uh, with Slip the West uh, attending a lot of those committee hearings that Joy Bourgeois was in um, House Natural Resources. But it's always good to have Team Coastal present in those committee hearings when we are talking about $1.3 billion going out of the door for restoration and protection projects this year. Any questions on legislative update? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Just for, just for reference, you were at, uh, the governor announced 150 million of surplus. What was the total amount of surplus that the legislature had to use? Well, uh, after, after you the Constitution requires automatic um, distributions to the budget stabilization fund and to the UAL payment. So after those distributions are made, it's $450 million that was left in surplus. And how we, our, our recommendation 
stood by the governor. <clears throat> was approximately 200 million for DOTD because we had some, uh, it was mostly from match for this IIJA. We needed, we were trying to come up with, to get as much federal money as we could for highways, 150 for CPRA, and then we had 109 for deferred maintenance through facility planning. And I think that's where we got short of pretty good bit there. So, y'all did better than the division. <laughs> All right, any other questions for us? All right, thank you, Mr. Caffrey. Uh, now let's get a quick federal update from Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Russell, if we could actually get eager to the list of bills that we're tracking and not get eager to email those out, we can turn it. Good morning. It's all even good? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, today we just wanted to touch on some recent federal funding developments. Um, to put into context the FY22 appropriations, the subsequent FY23 presidential budget, and um, the Army Corps' announcement, their work plan for their FY23 IIJA funding. And then just a couple notes on some uh, federal visitors to Louisiana and a new initiative that we're tracking. Um, and I mentioned this some in our last presentation, but that was um, one day after President Biden signed it, and so there's a little more analysis to show on FY22 federal appropriations. At the top, I've got kind of how the core money was distributed by account, and we see 143 for investigations, about 2.4 nine for construction, um, as well as uh, pre-flat funding from RNT and O&M. Um, and also noting that congressionally directed spending, also known as community project funding requests, how they're beneficial for us and for Army Corps. But also at the bottom, I wanted to highlight that habitat restoration, coastal habitat restoration, also got some direct support in a much smaller mass uh, through the NOAA uh, appropriations and uh, the CDS congressionally directed spending for these amounts were from 150,000 to about 2.5 million but you know some were for shoreline structures oyster restoration data collection modeling um, coastal restoration so uh, definitely in a theme that hopefully we can participate in uh, in the near future and uh, the way they also handled the IIJ funding for FY22 um, for agencies that haven't made announcements like the Army Corps on their spending plans, is Congress kind of referenced how much they had for the fiscal year and um, just kind of acknowledging that but Congress wasn't really uh, doing further action than they did in the IIGA. So we're still kind of up to the agencies for a lot of that. Um, later this month, uh, President Biden released his budget, uh, which continued his. Uh, efforts of really increasing domestic spending, which is where we're focused at. And uh, I've highlighted several agencies or departments that are kind of relevant to our coastal environmental space. And in the first column, you'll see their FY23 top line budget number. And the next column shows the change from FY21 enacted. That's the reference they made given the time of congressional passage and then putting together their budget. Uh, so it, Looks back two years, but it's it's still pretty interesting. And then the far column shows the change, the percentage change from the enacted. And so what you'll see is that the administration continued to uh, kind of lowball the Army Corps, which is a long-standing tradition. The Ar Congress usually supports that. So you'll see they're 1.2 billion down from what Congress enacted, or 15%. And a lot of that is uh, from construction. It's about a billion dollars lower on construction. Uh, operation and maintenance is kind of flat funding, so they usually keep that level. And then MRT and investigations are down about 30%. So we'll, we'll obviously be hoping the Congress will work hard to boost that back up. Um, because while it's great to have IIJ funding for the Army Corps, you know, we don't want that to be whittled down long term. Um, other agencies like EPA and NOAA. Uh, and the Departments of Commerce, Energy, Interior, 
uh, don't quite have the same problem of being reliant on Congress to um, build them back up. Uh, what they'll face is Congress probably trying to slim them back down. But you'll see that EPA got about a 30% increase, NOAA got 25%. Most of NOAA's increase was to satellites too, so their climate and restoration dollars are pretty flat. So that's um, a bit misleading from our, our perspective. And uh, Department of Energy with their climate initiatives got a, got a huge boost. And that's important because that's in the same category as the Army Corps, the same funding subcommittee. So there's a, when you give to energy, sometimes you, uh, when you want to give to the Corps, sometimes you may have to pull from energy, and so that creates a, a competing priority situation that um, Congress will weigh. And then at the bottom, uh, the Biden administration totaled up climate investments, and they're showing a $16.7 billion increase in climate dollars from their last budget, which is 59%, so a, a huge effort. And as we talked about last time about Justice 40, you get 40% of the climate investments to go to disadvantaged communities. Um, per the CEQ's map and tool and guidance, you can see that's a, a huge amount of dollars um, that's being proposed that will have that stuff applied to. So uh, we'll continue to try to emphasize that there's lots of room for investment on, in climate in Louisiana. We have a lot of eligible areas. Um, but a little different than the uh, Army Corps story writ large is the New Orleans District, which did pretty well in the budget. As you'll see, they uh, about 100 million over their five year budget average, which I think is a, a testament to a lot of the work here. Um, there's only a little for construction. Um, the O&M is, is very high, 315 million. And um, MRT for uh, Louisiana is at 70 million, but they estimate that about 30 more billion will come from some of the shared Mississippi projects. So um, that's good that they're in. Um, a good starting position. And um, one other thing that's pretty small there, but we're very excited about, is getting the Lafitte Area Flood Risk Management Study uh, budgeted to initiate that three by three by three study, um, which is something we've been asking since that area was left out of um, several funding announcements. So uh, more to do there, but it, it's always good to be in the budget. So, Neil, just to reiterate, this is the president's proposed budget. Correct. And so there are obviously going to be uh, additional dollars or projects and issues that are added once Congress gets very hands on it. And we as a state and CRA have also sent out requests for specific projects. Uh, Lower Mississippi River, North Anza, Southwest. Um, so I would just encourage all members of the board that are in the parish of the Lovey Districts. Uh, if you've got needs for annual appropriations of Congress, now would be the time to get those in. I believe Scalise's had an earlier, Scalise's office had an earlier deadline on the request that we, we submitted to them, but um, now would be the time to get those in. So just so you can see these numbers, it's not a bond, this is just what Biden is proposing to Congress for budget. Fred, the President has taken the first, first uh, I guess, tone setting. Numbers and the Congress is responding, and uh, communities were trying to, you know, see where the misses are and where we can advocate for. And if y'all do have um, projects you're sending out to the delegation, I want us to be aware and keep that in our uh, conversation. I'd be happy to receive it and uh, implement it in our conversations. Uh, the House has appropriations deadlines at the end of this month, so their their staff has been soliciting things and actively reviewing it. And it's a little later, but it's still kind of early. Uh, you know, we talk about timeliness, and Congress is really far behind on uh, doing a budget by the fiscal year. And uh, so they have to respond as if they're going to pass this by uh, the fiscal year 2023 20, start. Uh, but they probably won't get to it for another year. But it makes it hard for locals and states to really strategically respond, so we have, we have to kind of go fast. Uh, another announcement is uh, from the IIJA, is that the Army Corps released their FY23 spin plan. Um, Congress gave for FY22, 23, and 24 money, 
instructed them to move quickly. And uh, we don't have too much news on the investigations front, but the big, the big ticket item is that Southwest Coastal got 115 million um, to do design build contracts for structures in the current 25 year floodplain um, in those three parishes. Uh, and Louisiana also got uh, 30 million in O&M, but uh, you know, we did very well in the FY22 um, work plan, and it looks, you know, Southwest continue to uh, be really successful there. So that's great news, and obviously we're going to figure out how we can make a, the, the required match for that. Um, you know. With the DC opening up, it seemed like a lot of federal folks wanted to travel down to Louisiana, and I just wanted to share some of these folks visited um, with the larger team Coastal. Uh, we'll start with uh, Chair Brendan Mallory, who is leading the Council of Environmental Quality. And this is the agency that um, puts the administration stamp on NEPA, so the permitting, environmental permitting. And also, one of the major tests they have is achieving President Biden's environmental justice goals, which um, she is the one who kind of put together that screening tool we looked at it that highlights different census tracts in Louisiana that uh, should or would be prioritized for the climate funding. And um, she heard from a lot of community stakeholders, um, and you know, we were able to overlay our, the governor's climate action plan, CPRA special master plan, and share all the stakeholder engagement we've done behind that, and I think they, uh, she was very impressed uh, with that. Um, the next one I will highlight is Christine Harada, the director of the Permitting Council. Um, they've been involved over three presidential administrations on the, the large sediment diversion projects, kind of shepherding this complex permitting project through the, the federal system. But also what they shared with the governor is that as uh, Mitch Landier and the President want to roll out IIJ money quickly, they're looking to the Permitting Council for advice on how to um, get some projects on the ground. And so we expect the Permitting Council to have an even bigger role than usual. Um, it was just uh, formally authorized with the IIJA, and um, they're definitely wanting to show their value. And what's great for us is they view our ecosystem restoration projects as real showcase projects, I think they um, are very invested in, you know, moving it forward for us, which is, which is great. Um, we were there uh, first, first visit uh, of the administration, actually. And then, uh, I guess, two weeks ago and, and this week, uh, Secretary Connor, Assistant Secretary Connor of the Corps is in Louisiana. He came with the Mississippi River Commission to receive testimony. And he is on a multiple day flyer with New Orleans District, um, touching on Louisiana's biggest navigation, flood control, and restoration project. So um, we're very excited that he's been coming down. And uh, we've been having some good dialogue with him already. He's uh, very professional, and uh, hopefully, more good things to come. And then I'll go past uh, uh, Sandra and Jeff, did these two slides extremely well. And um, we'll close with a description of this American, the beautiful challenge. And this was announced uh, earlier this month, sharing a goal of $1 billion uh, for local restoration and conservation um, through public private partnerships. And so the feds are putting $440 million uh, that have kind of combined funding from different agencies, with the vast bulk of that coming from the Department of Interior. And they're hoping to leverage through their grant programs, I guess another 560 million to achieve one billion for this this project. Um, the American the Beautiful Challenge that brand is referencing um, what some people know as 30 by 30, um, which is the Biden administration's goal to conserve 30 percent of land, 30 percent of water by 2030. They're taking this funding combined. <coughs> Putting this forward as a first step to really expand out upon that goal. Now we don't know yet what counts as conserved under the 30 by 30 under the American Beautiful um, Initiative. You know, it's an easement, it's a um, permanently bought out. Um, how do you, 
what counts as conserved ocean, like what uses can happen. So we're still learning for that, but the exciting thing for us is that uh, this $1 billion initiative will be a, a one-stop shop for a lot of different grant applications that are, are kind of related. And so communities, states can apply um, for property projects, demonstrate local buy-in, and um, through one solicitation. And what we've heard is that if a project fits better in another bucket than your original intention, they're willing to shift it over, which um, it can be a, a great thing as we talked in earlier meetings about capacity and um, you know parishes and local areas putting forth their best foot forward for uh, things they're familiar with and now the federal government will be hopefully doing less of oh you're disqualified you're out and more of let me help you adjust that so we'll see how that goes but um, that was pretty encouraging and um, We've definitely been emphasizing that coastal restoration should be a part of this. It's not just Western land. And uh, so that concludes my presentation and happy to answer questions. All right, thank you, Daniel. Any questions, comments for Mr. Miller? Just to highlight the Assistant Secretary of the Army in this field just said we'll be back in Louisiana tonight. It will be with the governor. Brent and I, a few others, will be having dinner with him tonight, and we'll be doing the flyover of coastal Louisiana tomorrow. Uh, he specifically asked to fly over to see the feet, Grand Isle, and Morganza. I know that uh, the morning those guys will be with him as well, but we will be meeting with him, uh, with Governor tonight in the mansion, and Governor will be outlining all the priorities for the coastal program. So just great opportunities that we continue to have these guys individuals at the highest level of the federal government come down here to see the progress and the work of the coastal program. So thank you, Neil. I appreciate the continued updates at the federal level. Members, I don't have any public comments at this time. Anybody in the audience want to make a comment? No, I'd like to motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Banks. About a second by Ms. Banks sitting over there. I want to see you guys fully. Uh, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody, for being here.